Hey friends, welcome back to Difficult Things, a an ongoing module in the Maranatha Global Bible Study. We are looking at the tenets of the testimony of the prophets and the apostles that Peter called things that are difficult to understand, difficult things to understand, and the difficult things that we can, should, and must do in light of these difficult things. So we want to you know, the a, a phrase that we carry as a family is do difficult things, die without regret. And in this session, session eight, we are going to look at the, the process of formation and preparation to steward the gospel of the kingdom. We talked about that in the last, last session. Because there are many testimonies in scripture of strategic formation and preparation that are given to us as, like taking David as an example, the Lord says in Isaiah 55, he was given to us as a as an example, as a witness. Because particularly in these stories, you know, they're not whitewashed as these flawless saints who never did anything wrong, but the Lord is not exposing their failures and stupid decisions and immaturities because he delights in exposure in that way. You know, you can look at 1 Corinthians 13, that love is gentle, kind, it doesn't boast, it rejoices in the truth, um, and it, it, it doesn't parade other people's weaknesses. Love doesn't find out things that you're bad at and then trumpet it to the whole world. So these stories that we're going to go over today, I believe that they're, they're stories of friends of God who, you know, at this point in their and they're, they're with the Lord. <laughs> and I think they'd be like, yeah, by all means, I would be honored if you would tell my story. And if my story, if my testimony can be an encouragement for someone to walk the narrow road with fidelity to the Lord and avoid the wide road that leads to destruction, then that would be a good, fruitful thing. And so I think that's why these stories are in here. It's not that the Lord just likes to air out other people's dirty laundry, but um, where we will just kind of in a scan, we'll look at Moses, David, John the Baptist, uh, and his lifestyle, Peter. And there is a, a character in the Song of Solomon, the Shulamite, the bride, that is a figurative summation of the, all of our journey. Um, so, and then we have some other stuff. So we're just going to jump right on in. Obviously, Moses, you know, he spends 40 years in Egypt, 40 years in Sinai, 40 years in the desert. So he's he, born and raised in the house of Pharaoh's daughter, spends 40 years in Egypt, and then flees, spends 40 years in his own exile, not ever thinking, I'm going to go back to Egypt. But then when he's 80, he goes back to Egypt and, you know, leads in the exodus and then spends 40 years in the wilderness and then is able to see but not step into the land of promise and then god buried him somewhere but 40 years in egypt 40 years in sinai 40 years in the wilderness wandering 40 years on its own is a long time but uh, 40 years three times is a long time <laughs> Uh, David had seasons in his life that we can look at because in the text we have the luxury of retrospect. You can look back over someone's life and see the strategic leadership of the Lord, particularly with David. Um, he was in Bethlehem, he was in Gibeah, he was in Adullam, he was in Hebron, he was in Jerusalem. And in Bethlehem, he's tested and sifted with hiddenness and his, I mean, objectively speaking, by all accounts, when you read read David's biography, you're like, I don't think your dad liked you very much and your brothers for sure hated you. And I think got permission from their father to bully David. But this is where he met the Lord and cultivated a prayer life and built, you know, harps. Like imagine fashioning a guitar out of whatever you, whatever you had around because he, he was so driven to sing to the Lord and fellowship with the Lord through melody. And, you know, and later as David would write Psalms that we have in, in the book of Psalms, 
he says, you know, I, I, Psalm 119, for example, he rejoiced in the law of the Lord, meaning he took the books of Moses and found God in the books of Moses. And that was his meditation day and night and day and night. And that's where he really got in touch with the heart of the Lord and, you know, had he conceived the dream to build the tabernacle that would then be the temple that his son Solomon would build, all of these things. Uh, Gibeah, then he's tested with promotion and praise and prominence that he had never experienced before, and he's suddenly brought into the court of the king and, and marries one of the king's daughters. Just instant promotion. Saul, of course, is a psychopath who turns on him and tracks him down. He spends years tracking David through the wilderness with armies and mercenaries. The entire military force of Israel was tasked not with defending the country in the way that they should have been, but they had diverted resources, power, and military strength to tracking David down and trying to kill him. And David had the opportunity to kill Saul twice in this time, and he didn't do it, and that mattered to the Lord. I don't think the Lord ever forgot that. Because all of David's buddies were like, now's your chance, you should kill him. And then even when Saul did die, David did not rejoice in it, and he didn't immediately seek to go take Saul's throne and, and change the regime. He said, Lord, should I go up? And the Lord said, yeah, you should. And, and then David said, where should I go? Which is a very important follow-up question. And the Lord said, go to Hebron. So he went to Hebron. He's anointed as king. He's king in Hebron, uh, I believe, for seven years. And then... Then he goes to Jerusalem, and he's anointed as king. He unites the nation. Um, this is, uh, you know, so it, most of his life then was spent in Jerusalem. Most of his life was spent in the fruition and fullness of God's promises. But again, he was almost 40 years old when he came into that. He was anointed first in Bethlehem when he was like 15, 16. So it took 20 years of just this roller coaster clinging to the revelation of God that he received on the back hills of Bethlehem and trusting that God would make good on his word. But there were a number of times in Gibeah and Adullam where he was like, I'm not going to be king over Israel. I'm going to die. Saul is going to kill me. And people like Jonathan would go, you're not going to die. You are going to be king. You have a, a the, the word of the Lord is sure. You have a promise from heaven. He is going to make good on his promises. Um. Now, the thing about Jerusalem is his Jerusalem years, David's Jerusalem years, saw his greatest graces. This is when he started the tabernacle, night and day worship, 24-7 worship and prayer in Jerusalem. Um, that, you know, he, he gathered all his resources and drew up all these blueprints. And then Solomon, his son, built the temple. Um, but Jerusalem also saw... David's greatest failures, and he had a number of them in his life that, again, were not given or shown because the Lord's like, yeah, David was a dingus. He's just like, look, when you do something stupid, here's how I can respond to you if you come to me. But come to me the way that David came to me. And you were told in Hebrews to come to the throne of grace boldly. Run to the throne of grace in the time of trouble when you need help, which is every day. Um, and know that you are received there with a smile, which is, I think, one of the most audacious things about the good news of the gospel. One of the components of the gospel of the kingdom is that there is a great high priest who ever lives to intercede, who understands everything that you're going through, and he is your point of access to the Father who receives you with a smile when you run to him boldly. So I'm going to read from a couple folks in this in this session. The first quote here is from Mike Bickle on the three stages in David's calling. He's, he's speaking of uh, Psalm 78 verses seven, 70 to 72. So starting in verse 70, uh, Asaph is writing about David. He said, David, that the Lord also chose David his servant and took him from the sheepfolds, from following the ewes, the young that he had, had brought him to shepherd Jacob's people. So he went from it's like, Peter, you know, you're a fisherman now, but I'm going to make you a fisher of men. David, you're a shepherd now, but I'm going to make you a shepherd of men. So David shepherded Israel according to the integrity of his heart and guided them by the skillfulness of his hands. So here's the quote from Mike Bickle. He said, Psalm 78 was written by Asaph. 
He was a singer in David's tabernacle and one of the chief singers, one of the main leaders. And, and Asaph had a prophetic spirit on him as well. And he wrote this about David. You might go, oh, how do you know if he had a prophetic spirit on him? Well, the Holy Spirit canonized Psalm 78. So the Holy Spirit wrote Psalm 78 through the pen of Asaph. Um, he, and he wrote this psalm about David towards the end of David's life. We don't know exactly the timing, but there are three things to notice that he says in verse 70. Number one, God chose David. Number two, God took David from the sheepfolds. And number three, God brought David to the throne. That That is the idea of to shepherd the people of Israel. And David shepherded them. And here it is towards the end of David's life or soon after his life that he shepherded them with the integrity of his heart. And Asaph worked very closely with David, and he said, I've watched this guy for many years. David does what he says, and he follows through. And when no one was looking, David had set his heart to obey God and keep his commitments. That's integrity. Integrity is the distance between what you say and what you do. And as a king, he guided the nation with skillful hands. And it's not just meaning, you know, he was anointed, but he had actually cultivated leadership literacies to shepherd the nation as king and all the skills that are related to that. And there is an anointing, but there's an, a human side of cultivating the skills. There's work and labor and intentionality about doing that. So, you know, I, I earlier I mentioned Isaiah 58, the Lord in verse 3, he says, Incline your ear and come to me, hear, and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you the sure mercies of David. Indeed, I have given him as a witness to all the people. Here is what is possible in God. Here is how far you can go. Here is, is how much I will back you up. You know, I'm thinking of, of Second Chronicles. I don't know the verse offhand. I just know it's in Second Chronicles. I think it's in chapter 16. And uh, it says that the eyes of the Lord are searching to and fro across the earth, looking for hearts that are completely devoted to the Lord, on whose behalf he can show himself strong. And David is an example of a heart that was completely given to the Lord. For all of David's humanity, he, he was a man, God said, he's a man after my own heart. And the Lord loves to apprehend hearts that are completely given to him so that he can show himself strong through your life. And he did so with David. Sure mercies of David, a witness to the people, a commander and a leader for the people. First Samuel 13, and again, Peter reiterates it in, in Acts 13, that David was a man after his own heart. And then he says in Acts 13, 36, he says, David had, he fell asleep and was laid with his fathers. He's making the point, like, guys, I know we love David, but David died and he's still dead. Jesus died and wasn't dead long enough to start decaying because he was resurrected. So that's the point that he's making, but he says that David fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption after he had served the purposes of God in his own generation. David did everything that he was supposed to do, everything that was set before him, any assignment that the Lord gave him, David did it. He ran the race and he finished it. Hey guys, I want to remind you about our $5 a month giving campaign. If you want to have an impact on the unreached and unengaged of the world, if you want to see the gospel go forth into the 1040 window, it's as simple as giving $5 a month. We like to say you could give up a cup of coffee and, and change the Middle East. If you're interested in doing so, you can check out the link below. I believe it's faimission.org slash donate or faistudios.org slash donate. Thank you very much. And then another example here is John the Baptist. Um, there's a lot of his his origin story in Luke chapter 1 and John chapter 1. Um, a, a lot of Luke 1 is devoted to the, the birth of, of John the Baptist. Um, the angel says to Zechariah, this is Gabriel, saying to Zechariah, um, John's father, he says, you know, hey, you're, you, get, you and your wife have... You're old, advanced in years. You're like past childbearing age, but we've heard all of your prayers for a child. The Lord has heard your prayers. Your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will call him John. 
he will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth. And then he gives uh, restraints. He's going to be consecrated. He's going to be a Nazarite. Um, he will not drink wine or strong drink, which means that while Elizabeth is pregnant with him, she also cannot eat grapes or drink wine, no fruit of the vine. He will turn many of the children of Israel to their Lord. He will go before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedience of the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. You know, Revelation 19, 7, the bride has made herself ready. So John the Baptist's assignment was to help the bride get ready. And he would later say, I'm, I'm a friend of the bridegroom. The bride does not belong to me. So it's okay that my ministry and my prominence is diminishing and Jesus is becoming, you know, kind of the, the shiny new ministry guy in the nation. He should, he's the bridegroom. The bride belongs to him. John's ministry was to help the bride get ready. And I think that any stewardship, any proclamation of the gospel of the kingdom, making disciples who make disciples, ultimately this is for the maturity of the church, or another way you could say that is the readiness of the bride. Ephesians 5, that he, that Jesus might present her to himself in splendor and radiant and blameless. That was the ministry of John the Baptist. I think it's the ministry of of any any you know leadership or parental position in the church today your job is to help prepare the people of the lord for the lord uh zechariah was filled with the holy spirit this is at you know so obviously he gets this prophecy from gabriel and he was like yeah but are you sure because you know and then he's mute for nine months his wife gets pregnant bears a son and 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 he writes on the tablet, this is day eight, John's getting circumcised, and so the dad is the one who's to name the son, and he says his, his name will be John, and everybody's like, hey, are you sure? Like, you know, Elizabeth had said John, but your name is Zechariah, are you sure you don't want to just name him like Zechariah Jr.? And he goes, no, 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 his name will be John, and then he could speak again, and as soon as he could, he was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old. Just take a look, like do some kind of like term search or something in the New, in the New Testament and see how often they said, just like he said through the prophets, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. So, I mean, Zechariah is prophesying about things that haven't even happened yet, still have not happened yet to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to his father Abraham, to grant us that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies might serve the Lord without fear, that Jacob could lie down unafraid. He's quoting the prophets. He says, a new child, he's speaking to his eight-day-old son John, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways. Isaiah 40 a voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins. He came once to atone for sin and death because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. And the child grew and became strong in spirit and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. That's all we know, that he was prophesied before he was conceived. He was prophesied right when he was born. And then he was in the desert until the day of his appearing to, to Israel. And when you then find him, he's got this reputation for being a little quirky because he's, you know, he wears, he is um, living what you might call a fasted lifestyle, right? So he doesn't have We'll just put it this way. Jesus said in Matthew 18, this is this is as John is in prison. He's not long before he gets beheaded for something like, you know, you look at the, the arc of John's life and ministry, and then he's thrown in prison and beheaded, not even necessarily because of the message of repentance he was preaching, but it was the message of repentance he was preaching confronted Herod's ego. He, he offended the ego of the king, and he got beheaded because the king was entrenched in a relationship he shouldn't have been in, and she told him, yeah, cut his head off. 
So it's just a, it feels anticlimactic in a way, you know, for all of John's story that is, is that's how his life ended in this age is, uh, not heroic, but his heart postured towards the Lord until he, he met his maker, um, you know, crossing the, the threshold of space and time, however that works. Uh, he, he lived what Jesus calls a life of holy violence. And he, so the, uh, John the Baptist had sent a couple of his disciples to come and, and engage Jesus in a conversation and say, you know, Hey, are, is, are you the guy? Are you the one that we're looking for? Cause John's in prison. Do we lock up with you now? And maybe John was wondering, like, this is it, right? I am of I am inclined to think that John the Baptist knew exactly who Jesus was, and he was pushing his disciples over to Jesus. But some might say that John was John himself was wondering. Maybe John was human. But so he talks to them and he says, You go tell John that the blind see, the lame walk, you know, all of these things are happening. Like it, it's on, it's time. It's happening, and I am the guy. And so as they went away. In Matthew 11, verse 7, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. And they said, what did you go out to the wilderness to see? Did you see a reed shaken by the wind? Did you see a guy with no backbone who would just get tossed around by whatever was going on, whatever trends were happening? No. So what did you go out to the wilderness to see? Because the nation was going out in droves to, to hear John the Baptist preach. And he goes, so so what did you go to see? Did you see a man dressed in soft clothing? No, you wear soft clothing if you live in the king's house. And John did not live in the king's house. John was in the wilderness. So what did you go out to see? A prophet? He said, yeah, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. Which Zechariah quoted. I bet when Zechariah was mute for nine months, he had a whole lot of thinking to do. He prophesied so many core key passages over his son when he was eight days old. And Jesus is quoting them again now. So yeah, that was John's assignment. And truly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen none greater than John the Baptist. Yet, the one who is least in the kingdom is greater than he. Meaning, this is accessible to all of you. This is accessible to me. What David had in God is accessible to me. I can reach for that. What John had in God is accessible to me. I can reach for that. I can reach for that kind of commitment and allegiance to the word of the Lord and clarity on what he is doing in the hour of my lifetime. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence and the violent take it by force. This is a good violence. This is a holy violence. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept it, he said, he is Elijah who is to come. He, he's fulfilling a lot of prophecies. This is a very significant historical moment. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So John had a lifestyle of consecration from birth that, now let's say his parents said, hey, this crazy thing happened right before you were born. An angel came and dad couldn't talk for nine months. And then you were born. He, we prophesied all of these things over you. And the angel said, you're not supposed to, you're supposed to be in Nazareth. You're supposed to be consecrated. John could have said, that sounds crazy and I don't want to engage in that. But he didn't. He honored that consecration that began with his parents from the message through the, the angel Gabriel. He honored it and maintained it all his days and cultivated a life in God that Jesus said was spiritually violent. And he apprehended the kingdom. Everybody in heaven knows John's name. Not because of John's prophecies, but because of John's posture. And he had prophetic clarity. He had, that's Isaiah 40. He knew exactly who he was and what he was doing. He had prophetic integrity. Jesus said he had prophetic integrity. He was not taken in or bought. You could not buy John the Baptist. And that is ultimately what got his head cut off in prison. And he had appropriate humility, knowing that the mission was more important than his ego. So in John 3, when people are like, hey, you know, this Jesus guy that you just, you just baptized him, he's like doing all this stuff. He's healing all these people. And now all of the crowds who were coming to us are now going to him. And he said, 
yeah, he must increase and I must decrease. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears the voice of the bridegroom rejoices that he hears the bridegroom's voice. My joy is to hear him and serve him and prepare the bride for the wedding. Therefore, this joy of mine is complete because I'm I've done that. Oh, that all the leaders of the church would have that posture of heart. So we're gonna scan now Peter's story. I think we're, you know, Peter gets a lot of airtime, but for good and fair reason. So Peter <clears throat> We'll just jog through kind of some highlights. Matthew 4, Jesus is walking by the Sea of Galilee. He sees two brothers, Simon, who's called Peter, so Simon and Andrew, Peter and Andrew, going fishing. And he says, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. So then they follow him. Matthew 14, Peter walks on water. Matthew 16, Peter confesses that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. You know, because Jesus is saying, like, who... What are you hearing? What are who are people say? Who do they say that I am? That I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, "Well, some say John the Baptist, which is a little hard to piece together." But some people are just a little confused. Some say John the Baptist. Some say Elijah, and others are saying Jeremiah, or you know, maybe one of the other prophets back from the dead. And he says, "But who do you say that I am?" And Simon Peter answered and said, "You are the Christ, the Son of the Living God." Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven revealed this to you. And I also say to you that you are Peter. This is when Simon becomes known as Peter. And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Super cool, right? Immediately, the next verse he commanded, Jesus commanded his disciples that they should tell no one what Simon just said, what Peter just confessed, even though it was clearly accurate. He says, don't tell anybody that I'm the Messiah. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem. He must suffer many things. He must be killed. He must be raised on the third day. So then Peter took him aside This he's right after. He just gets, you know, the gold star in the class for, for getting the answer right. He takes Jesus aside and begins to rebuke Jesus. You have to admire him for his bombast, but again, there's no bombast in the apostolic, and Jesus will pop that balloon and deflate you real fast. So Peter says, far be it from you, Lord, that any of these things should happen to you. You're not going to go to Jerusalem and suffer. The religious leadership is not going to turn you over and kill you. They're going to receive you. You're the Messiah. Jesus, come on, maybe you're confused. And <laughs> And Jesus turns and looks to him and says, get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me. You don't know what you're talking about. And you are not mindful of things of God, but you are mindful of things of men. You are up to your eyeballs in carnal cognition. Stop it. Shut up. Sit down. And then he says, he says, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and pick up his cross. This is hard. Follow me, but it will be difficult. You will be required to do difficult things. But Jesus does not call you or Peter to do anything that he himself did not do. But the way of Jesus is the way of the crucified, and we are the cruciform, being formed into the image of the crucified one. Hello, everyone. Gabe here from The Wire. Wanted to make sure that you're all aware of a very special event that we have coming up. In less than two months, FAI will be hosting the Maranatha End Time Summit in Dallas, Texas. That will be three days of amazing speakers, good times, good food, great fellowship, and lots of wonderful things for everyone to do. Bring the kids, bring the family, bring the dog, bring your appetite for God's word and for some good Texas barbecue. Love you all. Maranatha. And he will lead us into our own Gethsemanes and Golgothas as individuals and as the body. And for the bride to be made ready, she will have to walk that road as well. Um, but all within a few pages of story, we have the confession of, of who Jesus is through the revelation of the Holy Spirit from the Father, proclamation, and then immediately 
he hears, get behind me, Satan. And then he's a witness of the transfiguration. This is all within a few pages. And then in John 13, this is at the Last Supper, Jesus is washing the, the disciples' feet. He comes to Peter, and Peter says, Lord, are you washing my feet? And Jesus answers and says, what you are doing, you don't understand now, but you will after this. Jesus is playing the long game. He's not threatened by our inability to understand things in the moment. And often he plants things throughout our lives so that when they do click, we look back at the story that he's woven into our lives and it just blows our mind. And Peter says, you will never wash my feet. And Jesus says, well, look, if I don't wash your feet, you don't have a part in me. And then he goes, okay, well, don't just wash my feet, wash everything. And, and Jesus goes, just, just your feet. It's fine, Peter, I got you. You're complete, you know, because you're washed by the water of the word. Uh, and then Peter says, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus goes, where I'm going, you can't follow me now, but you will follow me afterwards. And Peter says, well, why can't I follow you now? I'll lay down my life for your sake, right? You told me to lay down my life for you. He's quoting things that Jesus told him to do. I'll follow you anywhere and I will die for you. But Peter is here yet young wine. And Jesus says, will you lay down your life? He says, you will lay down your life for me, but you're not going to do it tonight because before the sun comes up, you're going to deny me three times. He can do a lot with weak but willing hands, even if the vessel is full of bombast because Jesus is very good at deflating the balloon of bombast and he will crucify it and mature, you know, the new man that he, he brings out of that. So, then, indeed, Peter uh, denies Jesus, and in the final denial, Luke tells us in Luke 22 that as the rooster was crowing, the Lord turned and looked at Peter, and I believe was praying for Peter. He told him, Satan has asked for you to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith would not fail. And I believe that in that moment that the, the rooster was crowing and all of these things were crashing down on Peter, I believe that, Peter, that Jesus was you know, in the midst of his own arrest and interrogation, looking at Peter and begging God that that Peter's faith would not fail. And Jesus is God, and all of his prayers get answered. And Peter's faith did not fail. And Jesus deliberately sought him out in the resurrection. You know, the, the women come to the tomb, and the tomb is empty, and uh, the angels pass on the message. They say, Go meet him in Galilee, just like he said. Go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him, just like he told you. And when they went to Galilee and Jesus met Peter, where they first met, met him on the shore of the, the Sea of Galilee, met him on the shore of the Canaret. For all of the questions that Peter was probably asking himself, for all of the questions that other people might have asked Peter, like, what were you thinking? How did how could you do that? I'm sure Peter was like, how in the world? I just said, I'll follow you anywhere. I just said, I'll lay my life down. And at first opportunity, I buckled. And I had three opportunities, and I buckled every time. Jesus's only question then for Peter was, do you love me? And he restored him with a spirit of gentleness because Jesus is committed to taking new wine and maturing the new wine into old wine. So I'll read uh, from John 2. Uh, you know, it's the, the wedding in Cana. And we're given a template immediately in the Gospel of John that Jesus transforms water into wine. And not only wine, but good wine, better wine. Jesus transformed water into better wine at the wedding. So flip to Luke 5, and he finds and befriends Levi. This is Matthew. He says, follow me, Matthew, tax collector, and he does. And then he throws a huge party, brings all of his friends, all of his sinner friends. And so the scribes and Pharisees say to him, why did the disciples of John, like the weird guy, they fast and pray, and we fast and pray, but you are discipling this frat team here, to eat and drink, and we're a little confused at your strategy, Jesus. And he says, can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? And again, we're back in the wedding. But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and they will fast in those days. Then he spoke a parable to them. He said, no one puts a piece from new garment on an old garment, otherwise the new makes a tear, it'll rip. And the piece that was taken out of the new one doesn't match. 
and no one puts new wine into old wineskins or else the new wine will burst the old wineskins. The old wineskins can't hold the new wine. What's the point to a wineskin? To hold the wine. So the wine the wineskin can't do its job if it has new wine in an old wineskin. And you'll spill the wine and you'll ruin the wineskin. You lose both. So new wine must be put into new wineskins and both are preserved. You keep the wine, you keep the wineskin. And no one having drunk old wine immediately desires new. He says, we all know the old is better. Old wine is better wine. Old wine is mature wine. And so Jesus's ambition and leadership over your life is to mature you from the new wine of bombast into the old wine of maturity, the superior wine of mature wine. And we see this in the life of the Shulamite, in the, in the journey of the Shulamite, in the Song of Solomon, who we meet in young, sincere immaturity in chapter one. And, and then, you know, she says, your love is better than wine, draw me away. And he goes, cool, come with me. And she goes, well, no, you turn until the day breaks and the shadows flee, until you split the sky, you go do your thing. And I'll just stay here where I'm comfortable and do comfortable. Th- I, I don't want to do difficult things right now. And then by chapter four, she, you know, she has these different interactions with him. It's a longer story. And by chapter four, verse six, she says, yeah, until the day breaks and the shadows flee away, I will go my way to the mountain of myrrh. I will follow you on the narrow road of the cruciform. I will do difficult things. So this is a a turning. She's saved. She's already in the kingdom, but now she's saying, yeah, I am willing to grow up a bit. And, you know, by chapter seven, she's declaring, I belong to him and he wants me. I, I am my beloved. His desire is for me. And, and then emerges from this wilderness and the people who had seen her at the start of it, see her and go, well, who is this coming up from the wilderness, leaning on her beloved, all of our lives and journeys and the corporate body life and journey for the bride made ready looks like us coming up from the wilderness, leaning on the beloved that we belong to. So I will, uh, I'll leave you with a quote from a man named Art Katz from his book, Apostolic Formation, because leaning on your beloved you know, I think harkens to Jacob getting into a wrestling match with the angel of the Lord in the middle of the night and walking away with a limp that he limped with all his days. And there is something in formation and preparation that requires you to be crippled somehow. And for Jacob, literally, he was literally crippled. You know, the Shulamite is leaning on her beloved. She's not walking in her own strength anymore. She's leaning on him and his leadership. So Art, Speaking of of Moses, he says, 40 years earlier and out of his own self-initiated conduct. So when Moses was 40 years old, Moses had sought to deliver his people from Egyptian bondage, but it eventuated in the death of one Egyptian hastily buried in the sand, and Moses was required to flee into the wilderness. And when the moment of encounter came, the true fulfillment of his calling was given. To what degree, therefore, must failure precede a true appropriation of one's calling? It certainly was true for Paul and Moses. In all our wishful intentions to serve God, are we willing for the humiliation of failure allowed and established by God himself? God forms a man whom he can send only out of the debris, the death, and the mortification of that failure. There is something about failure that does a necessary deep work in the human soul like nothing else can. You mentioned Paul here. We'll talk about Paul exclusively in a, in a coming session. The fact that we have not experienced failure is more likely a statement that we have not had apostolic intention. Peter also failed dismally, but a great apostle came forth from that humiliating failure. Any impatience, self-will, religious ambition, the compulsion to do for God, and the need to be recognized and acknowledged will never be a glory unto God. In his 80th year, When God confronts Moses at the burning bush and sends him, Moses said, who am I that I should go? He is a broken man. 
He is one who has been truly emptied out of all his human qualifications. Moses is now a man that has not a whit of confidence that he can perform anything. He's crippled now, let alone deliver an entire people out of bondage. The whole preliminary work of God is to disqualify us before we can be qualified. The whole preliminary work of God is to disqualify us before we can be qualified. How many of us are itching to go out and make our mark for God? And yet, God does not think it lavish, wasteful, or extravagant to give Moses another 40 years of waiting in the wilderness until he is completely emptied out, and then God calls him. Formation and preparation often looks like waiting in the wilderness and God leveraging your failure to deflate the balloon of your bombast and ego so that he can entrust you with the stewardship of the gospel of the kingdom to do difficult things and die without regret. Maranatha.